It's been two weeks since we were here Friday nights on extra biblical literature, so maybe a little review would be necessary. Second Estrus fits in a category by itself, the apocalyptic category of the apocryphal works, which makes it very interesting and unique and distinct among the books. Apocalyptic means a revelation or an unveiling, and invariably it has to do with future events. Invariably the future events aren't just future from the point of reference of the author of the book, but they're end time events. Biblical examples would be portions of Isaiah, Isaiah's little apocalypse like Isaiah 24 through 27. Portions of Ezekiel like the last nine chapters, chapter 40 through chapter 48. Various portions of the minor prophets, the whole book of Daniel, much of Zechariah, especially the first six chapters and the last couple of chapters. And more notably than any, of course, the apocalypse in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Second Esther is divided into three unequal sections. The first section is really chapters 3 through 14, the middle or the heart or the germ of the book, because this is the original part of the book, chapters 3 through 14, which give us seven revelations supposedly sent from heaven to Ezra, known here in this book by his Greek name Estrus. The section, this is the original section, chapters 3 through 14, basically concerns itself with the question of Israel's suffering, especially with regard to end time events. It was written by an Alexandrian Jew, date around A.D. 100. Why would that be interesting? Well, it's post-Christian times, which makes it very interesting. The other sections of the book will even be a little bit later than that, which make it interesting, and again, another unique feature that it features as being the apocalyptic book of the Apocrypha. Then we have an addition. We're talking about three sections, three dates, three authors, three themes. The book is three books, in other words. Really, the Catholics should never have tried to attach Bell and Dragon and Susanna onto Daniel and make one book, but rather divide this book up into three back in the early, early, early stages, and you'd have your extra couple of books. Certainly not one book, it's certainly three. Chapters one and two, written 50 years later by a Christian Jew, this time a Christian Jew. The heart of the book, the first section we gave you, 3 through 14, is by an Alexandrian Jew, obviously not a believer. It was written around A.D. 150 to explain why God had cast away Israel and why he had called the Gentiles unto himself. So it's an apologetic writing is what it's all about. And it's interesting, we've already covered this before two weeks ago. We've already looked at the first two chapters. It's interesting because of New Testament quotations. <coughs> Fifty years after the death of the last of the original twelve apostles, certainly not the earliest post-New Testament book to quote from the New Testament, the, Clement, the epistle of, of Clement of Rome would be, well, half a century earlier, quite a bit earlier, but interesting because of that one fact, that it comes so early in history after the times of the New Testament. In chapter 1 and verse 30, we read, I gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. And then with verse 33, and your house is left unto you desolate or abandoned. is a quotation from Jesus in Matthew 23, verses 37 and 38. Then in chapter 1, verse 37b, blessed are those who believe but who have not seen. That's John 20 and verse 29, Jesus' remark to Thomas. And what I trust was interesting for you, it certainly was for me, would be verses 42 through 48 in chapter 2. 
which is a commentary on Revelation 14. Mm -hmm. Interesting to me, obviously, because of various teachings about overcomers and a so-called 144. You find the number and you find a group of people in Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> so any type of commentary we can find upon that, especially such an early commentary written about 50 years after John penned Revelation chapter 14 would be interesting for no other reason than that. So that's in the last section of chapter 2, verses 42 through 48. Uh, I think I'll go back to that and look at those verses again. I, Ezra, saw on Mount Zion a crowd too large to count, all singing hymns of praise to the Lord. Essentially the same as John's teaching. In the middle stood a very tall young man, taller than the rest, and he's acknowledged in verse 47 to be the Son of God. That you don't find in Revelation 14. But this man was setting a crown on the head of each one of them. And he stood out above them all. I was enthralled at the sight and asked the angel, Sir, who are these? He replied, They are those who have laid aside their mortal dress and put on immortal, which to me obviously suggests Christian martyrs. He'd be talking about martyrs here. The church had just gone through a period of persecution that included martyrdom it could have reference since he doesn't tell us here it certainly could have reference to jewish martyrs but the inference is probably if they are jewish they're jewish christian so when i say christian i don't necessarily mean gentile because he doesn't necessarily say gentile but remember we're talking about a christian writer who gives us these first couple of chapters it's post new testament period it's a hundred years after the time of Paul, or 90 years at least after the time of Paul, and 50 years after the time of John. So they put off mortal dress and put on the immortal, those who acknowledge the name of God. And they are being given crowns and palms, that is, branches from the tree. You'll find very similar imagery over in Revelation chapter 14. So don't forget this, because one of these days we will study Revelation 14. <clears throat> and those people today who talk about overcomers and 144,000, I'm sure they have no idea that Second Estrus is even in any book anywhere and that Revelation 14 has a commentary about it in the book of Second Estrus. In other words, my point is, if you do a study of that, why not do it complete if you're going to do it at all? Amen. Who is the young man setting crowns on their heads and giving them palms? The angel said he's the son of God, which is a little unusual. Whom they acknowledge in this mortal life. I began to praise those who stood so valiantly for the Lord's name. You see, they must have stood for his name. They had not denied his name, as we read back in Revelation 2 and 3. And the angel said to me, Go and tell my people all the great and wonderful acts which of the Lord God that you have seen. Now, don't anyone misinterpret me. I'm not suggesting that here's the fulfillment of Revelation 14 or something. I'm just saying it's interesting that here we've got a commentary on Revelation 14. So if you're going to know anything about that chapter, you ought to know the various uh, source material that you have that would comment upon that. Finally, we've got chapters 15 and 16. This is a third of the three sections. Chapters 15 and 16 which were written A.D. 250 by another Jewish Christian in order to explain and to predict the downfall of the Roman Empire. Under the name of Babylon, because of the alleged author, the pseudonymous Estrus or Ezra, Ezra during his time would have been predicting, if he's going to predict anything, the downfall of Babylon, because Rome didn't really even exist, certainly not as a world power then. Oh, it had been on the scene for a couple of centuries, but it started just as a little city on the banks of the Tiber River. 
So we're talking probably in these last couple of chapters about the downfall of the Roman Empire. If this is written 250, then Rome falls around 476, so we're talking about 200 years in advance. The writer of the last couple of chapters is predicting and prophesying about the downfall of Rome and the downfall of the Roman Empire. Now, two weeks ago, we had gotten through chapters 1 and 2. We would gotten up into the heart of the book where we spend most of our time, chapters 3 through 14. And remember, these chapters deal with the seven revelations of Ezra. And all of these concern end-time prophecies and therefore end-time events. We're going to go back and review the first one because we had worked our way halfway through that. We would gotten through the question aspect of it, but not the answer aspect. From the first verse of chapter 3 through the 20th verse of chapter 5, we have the first of the seven revelations. And we've already shown you in the introductory message to Second Estrus uh, several weeks ago how we can very easily determine where the book really begins, chapter 3 and verse 1, and where it really ends, chapter 14, verse 48, plus add on a couple of extra things such as the date with regard to creation, the fact that Ezra was bodily assumed to heaven. Because that's stated earlier in the book that after he gives this, then he's going to assume, and yet we never see him in our edition going to heaven. That's because part of that was taken out so that we could legitimately believe the last two chapters, which we don't anyway, because they didn't take out the earlier verse. Here, Ezra questions why God sent Israel into captivity. Now, it wasn't written by Ezra, though, was it? So what's the question really about? If we're talking about 150, or rather 100 A.D., it purportedly gives us Ezra's questions about God's justice, the theodicy of God, on why he allows Israel to go into captivity. That would be for Ezra, for Ezra's time period. But, I mean, it's a little bit late if we know, and we know this, if we know it's being written in A.D. 100, it's a little late to ask questions about the Babylonian captivity. That was seven centuries earlier, whenever that took place. It's a question about the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, just 30 years prior to this. That's what the question is about. But, of course, you have to assume that because it's all cloaked over and put back during Ezra's time period. So remember that as we look through here. Everything has to be transposed in your mind. Really, the question is why Jerusalem fell and the city and the temple was sacked by the Romans. The question aspect is primarily seen in chapter 3, where Ezra connects Adam's evil nature to that of Israel. Because Israel has descended from Adam, she's evil. But his argument towards the end of the chapter is, so is every other nation, because in like manner they too have descended from Adam. And it boils down the last three verses, 34, 35, and 36 of chapter 3. It boils down to this argument. We know that our nation is a sinning nation just like every other nation. But is our nation not more righteous than the other nations? He says in verse 34, So weigh our sins in the balance against the sins of the rest of the world, and it will be clear which way the scale tips. Has there ever been a time when the inhabitants of the earth did not sin against you? Has any nation ever kept your commandments like Israel? In other words, he knows which way it's going to tip. He feels it will tip in favor of Israel, and therefore it will tip against the rest of the world. You may find one man here and one there, but he said nowhere will you find a whole nation like you found of Israel. Okay, so that's what his question is. Remember we're talking about why this has happened to Israel. So beginning tonight with new material, chapters 4 and 5 through verse 20, the angel begins to give somewhat of an answer, but really the answer is contingent 
upon whether Ezra can answer some other questions. In other words, the angel says, you answer mine and I'll answer yours. So the angel, chapter 4 and verse 1, says, you are at a loss to explain this world. Do you then expect to understand the ways of the Most High? Now that's a biblical theme. Where? The book of Job. God says, Job, you can't explain anything about the world. You expect to understand the ways of the Most High? Job learned a lesson, but oh, Ezra here is pretty rebellious. Yes, my Lord, I replied. I mean, that verse, when you really study these things carefully, like I've done, that verse knocks this out of the canon for me. Job, whenever God came to Job, Job didn't say, yes, Lord, I do expect to understand things in heaven. He laid his hand on his mouth and repented. Ezra would never have done something like this to an angel of God. He would have repented in a hurry. This is some false soul writing this, remember. I mean, that's fairly presumptuous to say yes. I've been sent to propound to you three of the ways of this world. We're going to read a lot of chapter 4 because in irony, it, it mocks the lack of understanding that Ezra has about this world and the next. He continued to give you three illustrations. If you can explain to me any one of them, then I will answer your question about the way of the Most High and teach you why the heart is wicked. The question involves sin. He said, I'm going to ask you three things with three illustrations. Very interesting. And see which one of us could answer any of these. So here's boastful, presumptuous pseudo-Ezra. I said, speak on, my Lord. Come then, he said, weigh a pound of fire. Never thought of that? I mean, he is a good writer. We've never criticized, for the most part, the authors, the authors of the Apocrypha, maybe a few, but most of the time they're excellent writers. That's, that's a thought worth pondering. How much does a pound of fire weigh? I mean, where would you get to make sure you've got a pound of it? and put it on scales and weigh a pound. You say, well, obviously a pound of fire would weigh a pound. Well, then start weighing it out. Mm -hmm. He says, weigh me a pound of fire. Number two, measure a bushel of wind. You know what a bushel is. It's a measurement. A bushel of the wind. Or number three, call back a day that has passed. Three things that we're familiar with, fire, wind, and time. And he said, just, you know, demonstrate your superiority over the natural elements by being able to answer one of these obvious, simple questions. You've got fire leaping all around you. Just grab a pound worth of it, which is, of course, impossible. How can you ask me to do that? I replied, no man on earth can do it. He said, suppose I'd ask you, you know, if that's too hard, let's go to some more. How many dwellings are there in the heart of the sea? Or how many streams to feed the deep? Or how many water courses above the vault of heaven? Where are the paths out of the grave and the roads into paradise? You know, the souls that leave the body from the grave, where's that road? Could you show us where the road is that the soul goes on from the grave up to paradise? That's very interesting. He said, you might have replied, I've never been down into the deep. I've not yet gone into the grave. I've never gone up into heaven. So he said, I can understand why you couldn't answer those questions. But as it is, I have only asked you about fire, wind, and yesterday. Things you are bound to have met, and yet you have failed to tell me the answers. <laughs> if then, he went on, you cannot understand things you have grown up with, then how can your small capacity comprehend the ways of the Most High. A man corrupted by the corrupt world can never know the way of the incorruptible. That's a famous saying out of the Apocrypha. A man corrupted by the corrupt world can never know anything but corruption. When I heard that, I fell prostrate and exclaimed, better never to have come into existence than to be born into a world of wickedness and suffering which we cannot explain. You see, Job went through some of these various remonstrations, but it was against his friends and never against God. He replied, I went out into a wood and the trees of the forest were making a plan. 
They said, Come, let us make war on the sea, force it to retreat, and win ground for more woods. He's not the only one that gives life to trees like we have to poor little December evergreen trees. The ways of the sea made a similar plan. They said, come, let us attack the trees of the forest, conquer them, and annex their territory. The plan made by the trees came to nothing, for fire came and burnt them down. The plan made by the waves failed just as badly because the sand stood its ground and blocked their way. He said, if you had to judge between the two, which would you pronounce wrong and which would you pronounce right? I answered, both were wrong because their plans are impossible. For the land is assigned to the trees and to the sea is allotted a place for its waves. Yes, he replied, you have judged rightly. Why then have you failed to do so with your own question? In other words, your questions should be restrained to your own sphere. Just as the land belongs to the trees and the sea to the waves, so men on earth can understand earthly things and nothing else. Only those who live above the skies can understand the things above the skies. But you see, Ezra, pseudo estrus is still not satisfied here. He continues, he continues to keep pushing the issue. Tell me, my Lord, I said, why then have I been given the faculty of understanding? And that's what he's using now is just human logic and reasoning here. Well, why should I have the ability to understand if I can't understand? My question is not about the distant heavens, but about the things which happen every day before our eyes. Why has Israel been made a byword among the Gentiles? And he goes on questioning God's justice. The angel answered, if you survive, you will see. If you live long enough, you will marvel for this present age is quickly passing away. Okay, now for the first time we're getting into end time events. This is what the book just picks up with and draws it out even more. Starts on a low, humble note in verse 26. But you see for the first time he's talking in verse 27. He's talking about end time events, which is what the book has to get to to be in the apocalyptic category. The angel goes on in verse 30 to say the same thing that Ezra had said back in chapter 3. A grain of the evil seed was sown in the heart of Adam from the first. It all started with Adam, and that's how we get Israel as a sinning nation and the Gentile nations sinning as well. It says in verse 34, don't be in a greater hurry than the Most High himself. Getting over to verse 44, remember this goes down through verse 20 of chapter 5 to finish out this section. The angel still giving his basic answer that if you cannot understand the ways of the earth, then why would you hold me responsible to even try to instruct you in the ways of heaven? I said, if it is possible for you to tell me and for me to understand, will you be gracious enough to disclose one thing more? Which is the longer, the future still to come or the past that has gone by? Well, that's another interesting question that we could deal with ourselves today that no matter when you live in history is an interesting question to deal with. We know time is an, an allotted amount. Where are we in that period? Has more gone past than we still have or more in the future than has gone by? What is past I know, but not what is still to be. Come and stand on my right, he said. You'll see a vision and I'll explain what it means. So again, eschatology is end time events. So I stood and watched and there passed before my eyes a blazing fire. When the flames had disappeared from sight, there was still some smoke left. After that, a dark rain cloud passed before me. There was a heavy storm, and when it had gone over, there were still some raindrops left. Reflect on this, said the angel. The shower of rain filled a far greater space than the drops of water, and the fire more than the smoke. In the same way, the past far exceeds the future in length. What remains is but raindrops and smoke. So he's telling Ezra that he lives at the end of the ages then. 
that most of the time that will elapse has elapsed and what yet remains is small in comparison to the time that's already gone by. If we skip down to the fourth verse of chapter 5, we come to some of the signs then. And we'll see more of these as we go along, but we see some of the signs of the end times. And remember the date, 100 A.D. The sun will suddenly begin to shine in the middle of the night and the moon in the daytime. Trees will drip blood. Stones will speak. Nations will be in confusion. The courses of the stars will be changed. A king unwelcome to the inhabitants of the earth will succeed to the throne. A king unwelcome to the inhabitants of the earth will succeed to the throne. Some important, wicked, latter-day king. And even the birds will all fly away. The Dead Sea will cast up fish. That night a voice will sound, unknown to the many, but heard by all. You see, it's certainly apocalyptic because you sit there reading, trying to figure out exactly what he means. And those of us who are on this side of the cross trying to figure out now how, if at all, this ties in to what we know the scriptures teach. At night a voice will sound unknown to many, but heard by all. Women will give birth to monsters. Fresh springs will run with salt water. Everywhere friends will become enemies. Doesn't a lot of this sound like the teachings of Jesus and the apostles? I don't know about women giving birth to monsters. I guess it would depend on what he meant by that. See, it's all cloaked. He had to unveil it a little more for us to know what he really means by this. But everywhere friends will become enemies. Well, we know that's going to be true. Then understanding will be hidden and reason withdrawn to her secret chamber. Many will seek her, but not find her. The earth will overflow with vice and wickedness. One country will ask another, has justice passed away or any just man? And it will be answered, no. In those days, men will hope, but hope in vain. They'll strive, but never succeed. These are the signs I am allowed to tell you. But turn again to prayer, continue to weep and fast for seven days, then you will hear further signs even greater than these. And he says, I awoke with a star. Well, we have to go back to the beginning of chapter 3. And we've got the possibility that, uh, well, since he says that he awakes here in chapter 5 and verse 14, evidently he's been asleep. And the first couple of verses of chapter 3 make allowance for that. As I lay on my bed, I was troubled. We read in the first verse of chapter 3. So maybe not just lay on his bed awake pondering, but lay asleep. I awoke with a start, shuddering, my spirit faltered, I was near to fainting. Happened to Daniel, I believe, on an occasion or two. But the angel who had come and talked to me gave me support and strength and set me on my feet. You see, there's so much here in this book that is borne out in both the Old and the New Testament that it can be very, very deceptive to people who read it. So in obedience to what the angel tells him in verse 20, for seven days I fasted with tears and lamentations. That rounds out the first revelation and section. We come in the second place to chapter 5, verse 21, through chapter 6 and verse 34. We have a new question now. The question is, what is going to happen to those who die before the end of time? What is going to happen to those who die before the end of time? If you need one verse for the question stated, this is the theme of the section, but it's in the 41st verse of chapter 5. Now, Paul deals with this in 1 Thessalonians 4. What is going to happen to those who die before the end times? 
before we hear that voice, you know, that voice that we read about back there earlier in chapter 5. See, 1 Thessalonians talks about that. When you see uh, so many comparisons to the New Testament, sometimes it almost makes you wonder, was he familiar with that? We don't have any way of proving that he was or wasn't. It's a little bit early for Christianity to be as widespread as, as being down in Alexandria and taking over so that people were reading the New Testament. So remember a lot of the apocalyptic material in the New Testament is based upon the Old. You'll find in Revelation, you'll find those things back in Daniel, back in Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah, and so forth. So in verse 41, I said, But surely, Lord, your promise is to those who are alive at the end. What is to be the fate of those who live before us, or of ourselves, or of those who come after us? Now, the ones after him, in other words, would be those after his time, but before the time of the end. And what's going to happen to past, present, and future before the total future, the end of time? And then the answer follows in verses 45 through 47. But my Lord, I said, you have told me that you will at one time and the same time restore to life every creature you have made. How can that be? Well, that's a lot like Daniel 12 or, as I say, 1 Thessalonians 4. If it is going to be possible for all of them to be alive at the same time, in other words, he's understanding now what's going to happen. The question is, what's going to happen to those who are already dead by the time the end of times comes upon us? And the answer is, well, they're not going to remain dead. Whoever's writing this book believed in the resurrection of the dead. Evidently, of all people, because verse 41 includes all people, past, present, and future. But yet he's still got a problem with the fact that everyone is going to be alive. And that problem here is in the end of verse 45. If it's going to be possible for all of them to be alive at the same time and for the world to support them all, then it could support all of them together now. Why not just have everyone alive right now? Put your question in terms of a woman's womb, he replied. Say to a woman, if you give birth to ten children, why do you that at intervals? Why not all at the same time? Why not give birth to ten at one and the same time? No, my lord, she cannot do that, I said. The births must take place at intervals. True, he answered, and I have made the earth's womb to bring forth at intervals those conceived in it. Now, we're not supposed to get anything wrong out of that, just to figure of speech what he means, but he's talking about those who are resurrected, those who are brought back to life. Not that people are actually born in the earth or something, like maybe someone would get from Psalm 139. An infant cannot give birth, nor can a woman who is too old. And I've made the same rule for the world I've created. And I continue my question so forth. Then chapter 6, verses 1 through 34, give us some more of the end time signs. And we'll take a look at just a few of the verses as we go down to verse 34. More of the end time signs that you have to put back with chapter 5. Women giving birth to monsters and a voice that all will hear, but only a few will understand and so forth. Think of the beginning of the earth. The gates of the world had not yet been set up. No winds gathered in blue. No thunder peal. No lightning flash. How do you like that? He said there was no thunder or no lightning at the beginning of the earth. He said there were no winds at the beginning of the earth. We see them after the flood. Foundations of paradise were not yet laid, nor were its fair flowers there to see. The powers that moved the stars were not established, nor the countless hosts of angels assembled, nor the vast tracts of air set up on high. So forth. Verse 5. The schemes of its... Well, let's see. We don't need... Well, 5b. God's seal... Nor had God's seal yet been set on those who have stored up treasure of fidelity. So some type of seal. 
like the book of Revelation talks about. Then down in verse 7, Tell me, I went on about the interval that divides the ages. When will the first age end and the next age begin? He said the interval will be no bigger than that between Abraham and Abraham. <laughs> For Jacob and Esau were his descendants, and Jacob's hand was grasping Esau's heel at the moment of their birth. Esau represents the end of the first age, and Jacob the beginning of the next age. The beginning of a man is his hand, and the end of a man is his heel. Between the heel and the hand, Ezra, do not look for any interval. So, oh, my Lord, my master, I said, if I have won your favor, make known to me the last of your signs of which you showed me apart that former night. He goes on to give this sound like rushing waters and, again, predicting some end-time signs, children only one year old will be able to talk. That's down in verse 21. Women with child will give birth to premature babes of three and four months who will live and leap about. You see, just to give you a couple of references over in the book of Isaiah, he's got some knowledge of the Old Testament. There's no doubt about that. And he's getting a little mysterious in what he has to say. But there are some interesting things in Isaiah's last couple of chapters, which are prophecy about end times, most of it, uh, such as chapter 65. Well, verse 17 to the end of the chapter is obviously end time prophecy. We turn here because of this reference we read about children one year old being able to speak and babes who are only four months old in the womb, they're brought forth then at the fourth month. And they're able to leap and walk. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. In other words, Israel and Jerusalem will just be filled with joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And here's probably what he's talking about. There shall no more thence, there shall be no more thence, an infant of days. Now we know, we can believe Isaiah's report. I don't know about believing Esther's, but we can believe Isaiah's report. He said there shall no more be an, an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die at a hundred years old. So, in other words, if you're a child at the age of 100, then why couldn't a one-month-old baby, one month after conception, not after birth, be leaping around outside of its mother's womb? Well, if you're going to reason that way, that makes all the sense in the world then. If you're only considered a child when you're 100, well, then when you're a day old, after conception. You ought to be able to breathe and walk around and talk. A child shall die at a hundred years of age, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Now, Bill Howes and the habit them, I don't know if we need to read the rest, but it's all speaking of the peace and plentifulness and prosperity that will result. They'll plant vineyards, eat the fruit, They'll not have their land and goods, you know, taken away from them where they build and someone else takes away, like God prophesied in judgment against Israel. Verse 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. So perhaps that 20th verse of Isaiah chapter 65 is perhaps the basis of what he's talking about here in verse 21. Children only one year old should be able to talk. Women with child will give birth to premature babes of three and four months who will be able to live and leap. Fields that were sown shall suddenly prove unsown, and barns that were full shall suddenly be found empty. Well, now he's reversing everything. There shall be a loud trumpet blast, and it will strike terror into all who hear it. Like 1 Thessalonians 4 and Zephaniah chapter 1. 
That time friends will make war on friends as though they were enemies, and the earth and all its inhabitants shall be terrified. Running streams shall stand still. For three hours they shall cease to flow. So what's evidently happened, he's gone back earlier in time, which is okay as long as we understand that's what he's doing from the point of time of verse 21. Although maybe not, though. Maybe his eschatology is just mixed up. Verse 29, while the voice was speaking to me, the ground under me began to quake. He says in verse 31, we're getting toward the end of this section here, if once again you pray and fast for seven days, then I will return to you and tell you greater things. So we come to the third section, the third revelation, 635 through 925. This really doesn't concern a question like the first two have, but rather... It gives us much detail about the future state of the righteous and the wicked. This section in chapter 6, which is rather long, we'll skip over from verse 35 through the end of the chapter, verse 59, is really just a recital of the account of creation. It's all about what was created on what day, the third day, fourth day, fifth day, he even speaks in verse 49 of the creation of Behemoth and Leviathan. So he's familiar with Job and other portions of Scripture. And he says, he rounds it up in verse 55, I have recited the whole story of the creation. That's what chapter 6 is about. Then in chapter 7, all in this third revelation, chapter 7's theme is the theme of the whole section, the fate of sinners and saints. Sinners have problems awaiting them in the future and saints have glory. He even states it in verse 17. He said in the law, it said that the righteous will enjoy blessings and the ungodly will be lost. So chapter 7 basically deals with that. And then chapter 8, on the basis of chapter 7, remember chapter 7 is our long one. You go by the verses as they number, what, all the way to 140. We'll come back to some of this later as we look at some of the errors of the book. But this is the long chapter, the part that was cut out because of its condemnation of the efficacy of the prayers of the dead. But chapter 7 is all about the state of, of the righteous and the wicked in the next slide. And then in chapter 8, to download chapter 8 has Ezra interceding for the lost. And then he's going to get rebuked for this. The angel reproaches him because he said, you're acting as though you have more compassion than God. I mean, God's going to judge the wicked in the last day, and here you are praying and weeping and crying about it. So he reproaches him for acting as though he has more compassion than God. Let's see, we'll skip over into chapter 8, verse 1. The angel said to me in reply, The Most High has made this world for many. This world is for many, billions, but the next world is only for a few. Hallelujah. He said, let me give you an illustration, Ezra. Ask the earth, and it will tell you that it can produce plenty of clay for making earthenware, but very little gold dust. <laughs> a lot of, you know, leaves on trees and grass and bark and sand, but not much silver and gold in comparison to that. The same holds good for the present world. Many have been created, but only a few will be saved. You know, many are called, few are chosen, that type of thing which is stated right here in the verse. One of those other things that seems to be an allusion to the New Testament. Then in the end of chapter 19, or the verse 19, the end of verse 19, which we've mentioned before, here begins the prayer which Ezra made before he was taken up to heaven. And then, of course, you have to add on to the last verse in chapter 14, verse 48, to get the conclusion to the fact that Ezra was going to be taken up into heaven which, as I've said before, is taken out so that we can legitimately add on and we could believe the last two chapters, 15 and 16. So here's his prayer, and he goes through the prayer. 
you know, God have mercy on the wicked, and he's reproached through this all by the angel for acting as though he is more merciful than God. Then in chapter 9, verses 1 to 25, we have more signs of the end times. He says in verse 1, Keep a careful count yourself when you see that some of the signs predicted have already happened, then you will understand that the time has come when the Most High will judge the world he has created. When the world becomes the scene of earthquakes and insurrections and plots among the nations, unstable government and panic among rulers, then you will recognize these as the events which the Most High has foretold since first the world began. Matthew 24. Just as everything that is done on earth has its beginning and end clearly marked, so it is with the times which the Most High has determined. Their beginning is marked by portents and miracles, that is, great signs and wonders. Their end by manifestations of power. So that goes down to verse 25. It's concluded. The fourth section in this middle section is chapter 9, verse 26, through chapter 10. The last verse of chapter 10 being 59. And this is the vision of the woman of sorrow. A little lengthy here, a little confusing until you get to the very end and you see what it's about. Now remember, two times before he told Ezra, you have to pray and weep and fast for seven days. And then I'll come back and give you more revelation. So obviously the events of, of this section of the book, or the book as we know it to be, chapters 3 through 14, are unfolding over a short period of time, but it has to be, you know, several weeks. We've got two periods of seven days. There's a couple of weeks to begin with. This time, verse 23, you, Ezra, must wait one more week, but this time don't fast, go to the flowery field. So verse 26, I went out. You even have a title there, Visions of the Last Days. Well, that's what it's all been about, but this particularly apply, applies to Israel and to Jerusalem. I went out as the angel told me into this field. 